Welcome back to 12 Days at March. In this section, we will review the pulmonary vascular disorders and the many derivative concepts that make for great board fodder. For purposes of orientation, I open each pulmonary section with this algorithmic approach to dyspnea, and the patient with pulmonary vascular disease will most assuredly present with dyspnea as a symptom. The algorithm is intended to help you organize the many pathophysiologic disease processes covered in pulmonary. It also represents a very practical clinical approach to the dyspneic patient. So let's get started on disorders of the pulmonary vasculature. Given the amount of material covered, I've broken the section into two presentations. In this section, we'll cover general information that applies to all of the pulmonary vascular disorders. In the second presentation, we'll focus on the specific disorders. In reviewing the pulmonary vascular disorders, I will use pulmonary hypertension as the teaching paradigm. The approach to pulmonary hypertension will cover the important disorders. So let's start with a working definition of pulmonary hypertension. It is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, with a normal value being around 12. As can be seen, pulmonary hypertension has multiple causes, and this is rich fodder for the NBME. Fortunately, much of their focus is limited to primary pulmonary hypertension and obstructive disease in the form of thromboembolism. So what do all these causes of pulmonary hypertension share in common? Elevated pulmonary artery pressures for sure, and the clinical stigmata of those elevated pressures, which include the presence of JVD, peripheral swelling, and accentuation of S2, that is the pulmonic component of the second heart sound. Heart sounds will be covered in detail in the cardiology section, but we'll cover them further as we move along with this lecture. Shown in this diagram are the normal right-sided pressures. Low pressures are noted in the atrium, right ventricle, and pulmonary artery. So the first question to resolve is the physiologic basis for the elevated pressure seen in pulmonary hypertension. We can raise pulmonary artery pressures by increasing arterial resistance. And in fact, this is exactly what occurs in two conditions, primary pulmonary hypertension and hypoxic vasoconstriction. In primary pulmonary hypertension, intimal hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the media lead to narrowing of the lumen. This is an example of an arteriopathy we'll discuss in more detail later. In diseases of the pulmonary parenchyma, such as COPD or interstitial lung disease, hypoxia leads to chronic vasoconstriction. Recall that unlike systemic vessels, which vasodilate in the setting of hypoxia, the pulmonary vasculature constricts. This is a well-designed and adaptive response to shunt blood toward well-oxygenated regions of the lung. However, if there are no well-oxygenated areas, as in parenchymal disease, the unfortunate result is elevation of pulmonary artery pressures. Do be aware of the consequences of chronically elevated pulmonary artery pressures. The right heart is designed to be a low-pressure circuit. To compensate for the elevated pressures, the right ventricle must either hypertrophy or dilate. The dilated ventricle will stretch the tricuspid annulus, just as occurs in dilated cardiomyopathy in the left chamber. Chamber dilation stretches the annulus of the valve, resulting in regurgitant murmurs. A dilated tricuspid annulus results in a systolic murmur heard best at the left lower sternal border. We'll cover murmurs and heart sounds in the cardiology section, but I mention it here so you won't be surprised by vignettes that include tricuspid regurg in the presentation of a patient with pulmonary hypertension. This is a consequence, not a cause, of pulmonary hypertension. So we just saw elevated pressures related to the narrowing of the lumen. Pressures can also be elevated on the basis of vascular obstruction. This is what happens in thromboembolic disease. We can raise the pressures through passive congestion from the left heart. Elevated left-sided pressures are seen in congestive heart failure, and those pressures are transmitted back to the right heart. This is also referred to as pulmonary venous hypertension. And finally, left-sided shunts can cause pulmonary artery hypertension. Depicted here is a ventricular septal defect. Although students do struggle with shunts, in this instance it is pretty straightforward. Increased volume and increased pressure are literally shunted through a hole that connects the left and right ventricle. The increased pressure and volume raises right-sided pressures and specifically the pulmonary artery pressure. We'll cover shunts in great detail during the cardiology review, but do note that left to right shunts raise pulmonary artery pressures. As we've just reviewed, all these causes share elevated pulmonary artery pressures in common. 
From the perspective of the NBME, the principal derivatives relate to primary pulmonary hypertension and thromboembolic disease. We'll explore all these causes further in part two of this presentation. Insofar as clinical stigmata, elevated right-sided pressures are association with elevation of the jugular venous central pressure. I mentioned central pressure to reinforce what the jugular venous pulse reflects. It is a measure of central venous pressure. They ask that question. Peripheral edema is present in these patients, and it is on a hydrostatic basis. They like these kinds of questions as well. The big ticket item in pulmonary hypertension is the loud P2. S2 is comprised of aortic and pulmonary valve closure. Under normal circumstances, aortic valve closure predominates the second heart sounds, as it should due to high systemic pressures. However, with the elevated pressures of pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonic sound, called P2, is accentuated. It doesn't replace A2, but when listening over the pulmonic region, the sound is described as loud or accentuated. The pulmonic sound is best heard at the upper left sternal border. Let me be perfectly clear. If they describe a loud or accentuated P2 at the upper left sternal border, they are explicitly telling you the patient has pulmonary hypertension. We've mentioned JVD, edema, and the loud S2. But what will the lung sounds reveal in pulmonary hypertension? Feel free to pause this recording and ponder the sounds of pulmonary vascular disease for a moment. Well, the lung sounds depend on the cause, but since this is a disease of the vasculature, the breath sounds will be described as normal. Blood vessels don't make noise. If the pulmonary hypertension results from lung disease, such as COPD or interstitial lung disease, then appropriate findings would be noted. If from passive congestion, rowels are noted. I do want to emphasize the NBME is not subtle about congestive heart failure. When they have a CHF question, they do mention the presence of Rawls and or S3. Finally, a shunt will have cardiac findings as well, but the lung exam will be normal. But the take home here is to expect clear lungs in the patient with primary pulmonary hypertension and or thromboembolic disease. Let's move on to diagnostic tests that are common to any patient with pulmonary hypertension. We'll start with the diffusing capacity. This is covered in greater detail during the presentation on AA gradients, including a description of how the test is performed. For our current purposes, please focus on this illustration of a blood vessel. As a result of lumen compromise, red cells don't easily or rapidly pass through the alveolar capillary interface. Whereas the majority of gas exchange normally occurs in the first third of the interface, in pulmonary hypertension, this is not the case. Red cells don't make it through or do so sluggishly. Consequently, there is a decrease in alveolar gas exchange, and this is objectively measured by the diffusion capacity. You can see in this patient example that the diffusion capacity is reported at 59%. That represents marked impairment in gas exchange and is consistent with pulmonary vascular disease. So alveolar gas exchange is impaired, and this is measured by the diffusing capacity. The other test to be familiar with is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. This is typically used to measure left-sided cardiac pressures. To briefly describe, a balloon-tipped catheter is floated into the pulmonary artery. There is a pressure sensor distal to the balloon. By occluding pulmonary blood flow with the balloon inflated, the catheter assesses pressures transmitted back from the left heart. The key point for this discussion is how the NBME will use the capillary wedge pressure. When they give you a normal value, they are telling you the patient does not have CHF. They like to give you the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in pulmonary embolism. It will be described as normal. Pulmonary embolism affects the right-sided pressures, not left-sided pressures. So to be clear, high pulmonary capillary wedge pressures are seen in congestive heart failure. In questions with pulmonary vascular disease, look for the normal wedge pressure. And here is a specific example. It is a pretty classic question. Patient is day three post MI. He has acute onset of symptoms, which may include shortness of breath or hypotension. On physical exam, the lungs are clear and there's no murmur. The EKG reveals tachycardia. The troponin is negative. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal. What happened? So you're thinking the guy had an MI, so this must be post or peri infarction complication. But the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is telling you this is not primary cardiac problem. Choice one, LV failure, would have a high wedge pressure. 
MI extension would be captured with troponin measures or abnormal EKG. If it is causing shock or dyspnea, they'd also have a high wedge pressure. A ruptured papillary muscle, which should happen on day three to seven post-MI during the macrophage phase of repair, should have the murmur of mitral regurgitation and a high wedge pressure. The consistent clue against cardiac disease and in favor of pulmonary embolism is the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. This is one of the clever ways they come after you with pulmonary embolism. So with this background in mind, let's take a quick break when we resume, we'll get into the specific disorders. If you have any questions or concern about anything we've discussed so far, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.